One of the things we're going to talk about today is the control of facial growth and development. Just the way I turned on the light when I walked in, I wish we could turn on the switch that controlled facial growth, but we just can't. So in continuing with the series that we started, to review different chapters in the book and to give you some idea of what you might want to focus on as you study this text, uh, we're going to talk about chapter 12, which is the control processes in facial growth. And the learning objectives for this section, as we read right here, are just to describe Moss functional matrix theory of facial growth as it applied to the cranium, the maxilla, and the mandible, to describe Scott's theory of facial growth and development as it is applied to the cranium, maxilla, and mandible, and to know why the sutural theory of growth has been rejected. Let me start with the rejection of the sutural theory because it goes back to what we talked about on day one, the basics of bone and cartilage. The sutural theory of growth stated that it was the intracranial sutures that pushed apart the bones that made them grow. Well, we know that that just can't be the case. And the reason is this, that bones can't push on other bones. Why? Because bone as a tissue cannot press on anything. It's not pressure tolerant, and pressure makes bone resorb. So the sutural theory is out the window. So we dismiss that first. So the question becomes, what's causing the tissue separating force in the face that's displacing the maxilla and the mandible downward and forward and allowing the remodeling process to occur? You know, what could possibly be generating this force? And in this arena, there are really two competing theories that you need to know about. One is Moss's functional matrix hypothesis, and the other one is Scott's cartilage theory. So those are the two theories that you need to have some idea of what's going on. Now let's start with Moss's functional matrix, and let's talk about the control of growth as we look at the skull here, the maxilla, What Moss believed was that soft tissue is primary. So what soft tissue mass is growing in the area of the neural cranium? Obviously, it's the brain. So Moss's functional matrix hypothesis holds that the growth of the cranium is due to the expansion of the brain. What about in the maxilla? What does the functional matrix say about the growth of the maxilla? Well, what function occurs in the area of the maxilla? Respiration. So Moss's function that drives mid-facial growth is respiration, is specifically nasal respiration. Now finally, we get to the mandible. And in Moss's functional matrix hypothesis, what drives mandibular growth? Again, its function. What are the functions of the mandible? Well, the primary function is mastication. So Moss's functional matrix holds that every area of the face has something that's driving growth of that area. And the parts of the body that are driving this growth have to be soft tissue. So the cranium is the brain, the mid-face is respiration, and the mandible is mastication. And that's essentially Moss's functional matrix hypothesis in a nutshell. So let's start and move over to Scott's theory. Scott was a surgeon and so he was focused on cartilages. And what he noticed as a surgeon was that if you removed or you damaged the nasal septum cartilage, that the mid-face didn't grow normally. 
So Scott's theory holds that the primary drivers of growth and development and the primary um, control processes are these growth of these cartilages. In the mid-phase, it made sense. It's the nasal septum. But now, what about in the cranium? Well, here, obviously, you have the synchondrosis in the cranial base, so those must be important in Scott's theory. And in the mandible is where the theory throw, falls apart a little bit because in the mandible, the cartilage is the cartilage of the mandibular condyle. And we know from our study of the mandible that condylar cartilage is not the growth center for the mandible. The condylar cartilage allows for adaptation and articulation but is not the primary growth center. So Scott's theory falls a little apart a little bit when we talk about the mandible. So what's the current thinking of uh, how do we put these things together? Well, the current thinking is, is that there's sort of a, a multiple assurance theory that says that, hey, cartilage is probably somewhat important, but so is function. So it's these two theories working together that probably makes the most cogent uh, reasoning for the growth and development of the face and causing the maxillary mandibular displacement. So that's what you should focus on when you look at control processes. There's more information in the book, uh, but these would be the highlights. Thanks.